Okay, everybody, if you just uh, hold on just a minute. By the way, how many of you guys were here when I began the broadcast yesterday? How many were here? You guys remember what I said? Because if you do, right at the beginning of the broadcast, now you know. Yep, it's that quirky. And yes, it ties in directly, directly to today. So anyway, I'm going to be back in just a minute. I have a few more things to set up. And we're going to talk about that uh, a portion of that ship. It is unfortunate. And I'm on the hunt for something else. I'll be right back in just a few minutes right here at COT. Okay, everybody. I am here. I got a paper to ask of you guys. I can't do it, but one of you can. Two things. Somebody go back at the beginning of the broadcast yesterday. At the very beginning. And find it. Make a clip. At the very beginning, I said it was... Uh, you guys remember what I said I was doing? Anybody? Maybe it's good it was not recorded. Maybe it's a good thing. But I said I was doing something. You guys remember? I said I'd be on the station. But I changed that. You remember that? I said I'd be on station for two days, and I changed it. I said I was hunting. There you go. You guys have it. You guys have it. Now what you do, now that you have that, right? Since you can't blurt that out, I'm not going to blurt that out either. Right? But you can share it with everybody. Because a hump was for a group. A group of people. People. Very painful hunt, right? For some people. Anyway. Keep that in mind. Also, you guys remember the dream about the tablet that was given. I mentioned a date, a, a number on that tablet that was given, right? Uh, and it was some bad activity that was going to take place. It was plans on there. Somebody find what number I mentioned. Somebody find what number was mentioned. For all of you, that heard me yesterday morning, listen to me carefully. We're going to get to know each other quite well anyway. So sometimes, sometimes I'm utilized in very uh, a unique capacity. Let's put it that way. But I want you guys to know it's no more unique than the capacity you have. No one should be in the dark. No one should be. Here's the problem. You guys believe in Christ. But when you seek to serve yourself, that's when you go blind. That's when you can't see, right? If you seek not to serve yourself, you'll see everything. Everything. Remember that. Have your heart towards servitude to others. You will not be blind in this world. There are serious things right, that are happening. And no one need be blind to them. Mayor has it. Okay, good. You guys find that. Also find the number. That was in that dream on the tablet. Where leadership was being warned. They were trying to be, they were being shown a laptop, a tablet, that has some nefarious plans on there. A number, I mentioned a number on that tablet. I want you guys to find it. Right? I'm not going to say that one either by the way once I do that normally I do not touch it again okay I don't touch that again somebody said 30 and 7 no that's part of something that's far older 
This is about a tablet. Something was on a tablet. Those who were with Hamas were infuriated. But they had plans all over the all over the U.S. for retaliation. All over the U.S. And once it started, it was not going to stop. It almost be like the, all these different types of activities. It was very troubling. Very troubling. So if you find that audio clip, uh, both out, both here in COT and I believe one was on Thursday night with a, uh, with Pastor Paul. I mentioned a number. Find the number and then you'll understand. And as far as yesterday, uh, the first thing I said in the broadcast, some of you folks have it in the room, some don't. Right? Some don't. But it's not over. Now, you guys heard about that ship, right? It's very unfortunate. It was a big container ship. Huge container ship. Hong Kong's container ship. That's what it was. Anyway, uh, container ships... You, you may be interested to know are under the command of Baltimore Port Authority. When they are navigating within the port, that means Baltimore has complete control. Complete control. Complete control. Not the people on the boat. Right? Baltimore has complete authority. Of course, that ship was uh, uh, Singapore Flag Denali. Right? It was... That ship was commissioned, I believe, in 2016, somewhere around there. 15, 16, somewhere around there. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty big ship. It's navigation type. Now, you can't quote me on this. I believe it's a azimuth thruster set this on the bottom, which means no rudder. Those are azipods. And those are electronic, right? We have azipods on the bottom of a ship. That means the computer can actually control uh, that ship, you know, navigating throughout any port. It can, and and uh, again, the any ship that's leaving a port like that is under the control of the uh, those people at the port. So in this case, Baltimore had control of that ship. Baltimore did, right? So, hmm. That we'll see. That's just very unfortunate. It hit that bridge. That part was known, though. Uh, I know it's unclear to most people if this was a terrorist attack or not, but I, I need to remind you. In order for someone to know what it, what type of attack it is, you have to know what happened to the systems. Right? You cannot come out and say it was not a terrorist attack. You can't do that. If you come out and say it was not a terrorist attack, then you know all the details of how it happened, and they did not. Keep that in mind, right? You, sometimes you have to use your, your the, the, the mind the Lord has given you, right, to comprehend these things. If you listen to the rhetoric, to the repetitive uh, speeches, you're going to believe exactly what's being said. You may be left, you know, in the dark. You need not be in the dark. Again, to know something, to, to have an idea of, of what actually happened is to have an understanding of the entire system. Now, the NTSB and all those guys are going to be involved. They're going to, they're going to break everything down and find out everything. But I can tell you right now, if it was a terrorist attack, they're not going to share it that way. They're not going to do it. Um, they just won't do it. And due to its motion... Right? Due to its, uh, the communications that did take place, we know they did not have, they, they, they saw where they were going. What you may not know is the Port Authority did not have the control they thought they had either. Hmm, that's interesting. And it just so happened to hit, or the uh, structured uh, uh, stability, uh, the stru-
instructors on that bridge, right? Now, you guys know I never come out with anything definitive unless it's absolutely 100% given to me. But listen to me carefully. A kid could take one of those ships, right? A kid can absolutely take uh, command of one of those ships and drive it into anything, just so you know that. In fact, if you turn off those azipods, it's going to keep its azimuth wherever it was flowing with currents, which, by the way, was going right into that bridge, right? So it's almost like it aligned itself, and it kind of wobbled a little bit uh, as far as navigation is concerned, and what bam right? It, it smacked into that bridge. It could have been a lot of things. It could have been just a, a group of unfortunate events, but listen, I, I, there's no way in the world a ship is going to lose power of all their azipods. That thing has multiple azipods underneath. An azipod is a thruster set, right? If it in fact uses azipods, it's got multiple pods underneath. Each one has a huge motor on it with a propeller, a turbine-type propeller, which can push that ship, right, very fast in any direction. That means if it's going forward and they engage those azipods, right, uh, 180 degrees from the rear is going to stop on a dime, okay? So they have azipods. Well, it won't stop on a dime, but it'll stop. There's no way all of those things lost power. There are multiple turbines on that vessel which keep power going. There, there are um, multiple computer systems, right, so that if one computer system fails, another computer system takes over, right? And if that fails, another one takes over to actually begin to uh, power those azipons and to drive them and keep it, you know, keep it uh, going in a specific direction. In this case, everything seemingly failed. Everything did, right? Everything did. So uh, I'm just, uh, it's very difficult to buy the fact that, uh, you know, that whole, all that system was going to shut down, right? And plus, who do you think drives those ships when they're in port like that? It is not the people on the ship. Do you know that? The people on the ship do not drive the ship. Somebody else is driving the ship from Baltimore, from that port. Okay, so there, there are too many things involved in this. Now, there have been mishaps before similar to this. They just didn't turn out that way, right? But it's just, um, I'm just not buying it for more than those reasons, right? There's also a knowing of a few things. A knowing I really can't share. I'm trying to give you guys hints about that knowing so that you know beyond reasonable doubt that uh, this isn't what uh, what it looks like, and it's not going to stop. I'm going to say it again. There are people out there that hate the USA, and the USA is so arrogant. They have dropped the ball so many times. They do not understand their own systems as well as some hackers do. Just like you know that. They do not. They don't. So here we are. Also, it's not the end, it's not the end of this. If this is a terrorist event, I have my own belief, a strong knowing. And that began yesterday at the beginning of the broadcast. But I have a strong knowing. If it is a terrorist event, it's not going to end. These are, this is a prodding. A prodding. That's what this is. So that makes, that was not the major event. This is a prodding for maximum damage. Just a prodding. That's all. If, if we continue as a people to be wise in our own eyes, we will become as fools before this whole world. We will. We will. 
We most certainly will. Do you guys know that uh, the financial center in, in the Middle East is opening up in a couple of days? Do you guys know what that means? A massive power shift. Hmm. Massive power shift. Somebody says, why didn't they send a tugboat? Listen, if those azipods are stuck in a direction, you can bring all your tugboats out there. The tugboats are going to be overwhelmed. They have no, they, they can't stop a ship going in a specific direction under thrust. I don't believe it lost all thrust. I don't believe that. Also, uh, looking last night, observing things last night, smoke was coming out of the top of that ship. So, uh, just so you know that. Just give me a little detail. That ship was observed being looked at since uh, yesterday at about 2 p.m. That's all I can say about that. Okay? That's all I can say. I'll say nothing else about that. Can't draw attention to us now, can I? But, Lord help us. If it is, in fact, in, uh, some sort of uh, payback, because I'll say it again, there are lots of people out there who through this Israel-Hamas war, they want America to pay. They want America to burn. Sound familiar? They want it to burn. They want it to burn. And the best, the best terrorist activities that anybody has ever come up with in history is when you make people think something happened naturally. When you make somebody think, uh, believe, that their problems have happened naturally, then you're, as they say in the business, you're good at your job. Right? You're good at your job. That's what the goal is. Not like, uh, you know, the obvious 9-11 attack. No, that was foolishness. It's to make people believe that something happened naturally. That's when you know something is at work. So I'll say in a boldness that people have been looking in the wrong areas for quite some time. Because we have sustained more damage from things that look natural that turned out not to be natural. There are always small subtleties, right? That give all things away. There is always a fingerprint, always. But listen to me, it's not a fingerprint that the public is going to find. It's a fingerprint that you are able to hear if you will just hear what these people are saying. For example, when somebody comes out and says, well, it's not a terrorist attack, and they say that, you know, that's the first thing they say. How can they say that without having combed through all the evidence? You can't say that. Even if they say there's no evidence of a terrorist attack and you have not gone through the evidence, how can you say that? If you don't know what the you don't know what the condition of the system was, you don't know the communication complexities and the integrity of communications at the time when it lost whatever it lost. You don't know the time stamps on the server and you have to know all that to have some sort of idea or conclusion. If you just come out and say, you know, we, we, we don't think it's terrorist activity, then that's a line somebody told you to say. You, you guys have to know the difference between the two. There are structured statements people will always give in the absence of evidence, in the absence of an investigation. They will give a predefined statement to the public over and over and over again. What that normally does, it satisfies the public. They don't want the public to fear anything that's natural, right? I always compliment that, too. I don't want people to panic either, but I like the truth. And so, uh, between today and yesterday, you guys should have that truth, and it's not over. It's not over. Anyway, that's where we are. It's just where we are in time. I just hope that you guys are prepped, prepared, and ready, because I'll say it again. When you look in one direction, 
right? We're, we're always hit in another direction, right? We are never taken by anything we're looking at. We're always taken by whatever we're not looking at. It's almost like a game of chess. But I will clarify something. Don't think it was from the inside. Don't make that mistake. No. You're in the middle of something. And you might want to look at this situation in a very real way. I know people are going to have their opinions. I know they're going to have their opinions. But ask yourself this. Whether you believe it to be coincidence or not, how can someone make a statement 24 hours or, let's say, uh, what was that, seven hours before something happens? How can someone make a statement like that seven hours before something happens and something happens that matches the statement? Well, then those people must know something that's going on. Please don't think this is some inside thing. You're in the middle of something. You're involved in something real. It's not some game. It's not. And there will be casualties. When it's obvious, then you can say, well, it must have been inside. When it's obvious. But it's not so obvious. No. You have very bad people in this country that are not from this country. They were born here, yes. Their parents were born here, yes. But they're not from this country. Their loyalty is not to this country. That's where you have to understand. I'm not even talking about illegal immigrants. No. I'm talking about residents of the United States of America who have their heart's loyalty based in the Middle East. And because of this Israeli Hamas incident, it has done nothing. It has done absolutely nothing but cause a person to take one side or the other permanently. That means there are Hamas operatives in this country. We used to keep count of 800,000 sleeper cells. That's a pretty big number of sleeper cells, isn't it? And then they drop the ball. What that means is you have foreigners, foreigners in this nation, right? And some are Caucasian, just like the average person. But their heart's loyalty is to the Middle East. Be careful about buying the paradigm that's so popular among so many. you got to be careful about that. There have been people for 50 years who have had a paradigm that they believed in and nothing ever came of any of it. All the while, people have been smacked in the face. By it seems what they had no capability of conceiving of. It is not the obvious that ever bit anybody. It's always what's hidden. These obvious topics, they're almost harmless, but it's what they're not talking about. That's consuming lives every single day. You guys don't know about the crime against women in the USA, do you? How organized that is. It's not coming from people who love this country. It's part of a tactic. The children, and the number of the children is part of a tactic. That's not coming from the inside. That's part of a tactic. That's part of an ongoing war most people know nothing about. They have no idea about that and all of it ties into a faith war you might learn something in this place 
because I know I listen, we're we're just at that point. You're gonna have to know some things, whether it's popular or not. You don't have to believe it. I'm gonna say it anyway. The more of the truth you know, the less blind you're gonna be in the world. The more precise your prayers will be. Do, do you guys know about uh, a tactic called faith corruption. Let me tell you what faith corruption is. Faith corruption is when you have these same individuals who have a loyalty to other countries. Hear me on this closely. And they talk to the populace in a very coordinated manner. They purposely have people pray for bogus things. I'll say it again. They have people pray for bogus things. I'm going to say it one more time. They have people pray for bogus things. When people do that, when they start praying for bogus things, they're not praying for serious things. They do this on purpose, believing it's weakening the faith of those who get no answer to certain things. They purposely do this. They believe it weakens the individual, the that, that container of faith. That's what they believe. They've been doing this since the Vietnam War. And it's been in this country. And it's so bad now. It's unbelievable. And it's only part of a tactic to weaken the faith of those who would have strong faith. Because every time you pray, and every time you have no answer to that prayer, you weaken that much more. Do you know that? You weakened that much more. If they can corrupt the faith base, if they can do that, then they take the spiritual dominion over those who have been weakened. They already know this. These are not people who believe in Christ, who serve Christ, or who enjoy this country. They don't need this country. They use this country. They use this country as a base of operations to tear it down, to make it explode from the inside out, to weaken it before the major assaults come. It just so happens you live in the times of major assaults. This has been happening for years. The same group operates with the women and the children. And they feed these insatiable desires of corrupt people in society. They coordinate the kidnapping of a lot of people. They do all of this to weaken society. These guys even have manuals they operate by, procedures they operate by. They are extremely savvy in what they do. And it's all organized. And it's all part of a, of a bigger tactic. And once everybody is weak enough, they'll take control. And nobody will withstand them. This is something that's been fought for so long. And it's already understood it's a losing battle. It is. It's a losing battle. It seems the number of those they recruit, because they'll get a person in the USA who is in distress and give that person $10 million to do something minimal. Go kidnap a person for $10 million. They do it all the time. Not too many people check the missing uh, persons reports. When you hear of a child going missing, it is so common these days, it'll go through one ear and out the other. That's how common it is. They know how to use every system within the USA, and they're very keen and astute regarding the legal system. They use jail-like hotels. 
They know exactly what they're doing. And they depend upon our arrogance. That's what they depend upon. For example, if a group went out and they caught one person doing something they consider pretty big, they're going to pat themselves on the shoulder. They're going to take it easy for a while. That's exactly when these groups wrap up their efforts for more damage. They do it all the time that way. Every time something happens and people start patting themselves on the shoulders, they just start wreaking havoc. And then all of a sudden the numbers of missing people, right? That just jumps off the page. The numbers of drug addicted teenagers jumps off the page. They're the ones that recruit and they help recruit and they keep these gangs financed. Do you know that? Who do you think brings the drugs into the USA? How do you think drugs come into the USA? Hmm? You think it's all coming through that southern border? Do you not understand that New York was one of the biggest major hubs anybody ever saw? They had a few busts, and it didn't even put a dent in it. And the other drugs come through Florida. <laughs> Lots of drugs travel by container ship. that they do there's a store there are things that happen here the public is not privy to it they want you to live a normal life they want you to have your hopes and dreams planted within this economy so that you will continue to do your part all the while a war has been happening this entire time and all the crime that we know of it's only one component of this war. Just one. There are people out there trying to make a difference. Always trying to make a difference. But most often, even those people will not coordinate. So you have the police force fighting what they think is war. Then you have other individuals fighting a real war here in this country. Unfortunately, you cannot share with all police departments exactly what you're doing because some of those people that are on those police departments are not very secured with the income they receive. Not every police officer is a police officer in heart. There's always a bad apple somewhere. Hmm? Always. Okay, well. That's good enough briefing for right now. Although there are more things happening, right? Just stay vigilant. Stay very vigilant. And continue to prepare for floods and fires, please. Know the exit points of your respective city, town, municipality, or your, your, your county, whatever the case is. Know how to get out of that town. Have an understanding that if anything happens in your immediate town, that the road's going to get clogged up pretty quick. So have a secondary route to get out of that town, please. Secondary. Mm -hmm. Boy, somebody said, should we avoid crowds? No, 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 no. Be sensitive to your Father in heaven at the Lord's leading. I'll say it again. If you are trying to maximize your life for yourself, you're going to be blind. And it doesn't matter what you do. When you care about other people, pray without ceasing, in other words. Have them on your heart. Have them on your mind in communication with your Lord and Savior. Always. The Lord will see that you're not blind. 
He knows when you're ready to commit yourself to the work of the kingdom, and he will not have you blind when you make that choice. It is your choice. You cannot force anybody to do anything for the kingdom of God. But if you ever choose to do it, then do it all the way. And the Lord will open up your eyes. One of the most important things a person could do right now is learn to hear the Lord in their own special way. For some people, they may notice quirky things in a very odd way, right? For other folks, they may notice, you know, based on people's behaviors, it is different for each person. Somebody asked me one time, how do you know if it's the Lord or not? Let me explain it this way. Have you ever been driving, right? And you had to make a turn. Now, you don't know why, but you had to make a turn. And if anybody would have tried to stop you from making that turn, you would not have listened to them. Everything in you knew you had to turn when you had to turn. And so you turned. The voice of the Lord penetrates everything about you. When he gives instruction like that, you know that you know that you know that you know you have to do it. Right? Right? And somebody can say, well, why are you doing that? He says, I don't know, but i got to do this right now. i got to do it. You have no explanation. Right? Why does that happen? Because you belong to him. If you belong to him, you're going to be kept. If you belong to him, you're going to be delivered. If you belong to him, you're going to have the victory, period. That does not mean your life is going to be easy all the way through. No, that means you're going to have the victory. Hmm? That's what it means. You will be delivered. The Lord's going to bring you all the way home. And so when he has to give you instruction, if there is something you must do, everything about you is going to know you must do it. And that's one of those times when you end up doing something and you cannot explain to anybody why you did it. You don't care to explain it. Right? You don't. You just do it. It's one of those times. And everything in you physically and spiritually and mentally and otherwise knows you have to do it. You'll never mistake the voice of the Lord by way of instruction that way. You will never mistake that. He will let you know. And you're not going to be sitting there wondering. I wonder if that was the Lord's voice. No. You will start complying. If you belong to him, you'll start complying. And he should the Lord should have given just about all of you an example of that. If you've not had an example, you will. Somebody says, I haven't had that experience. Well, have you ever had your phone ring and nothing was going to stop you from answering the phone? And then have you had your phone ring and nothing was going to make you answer the phone? Have you ever had that before? Hmm? You ever have that before? Have you ever picked up the phone and you called someone and nothing was going to stop you from calling that person? You just had to call that person. Anybody ever do that? You just had to make that call. Anybody ever do that? And no one was going to stop you from making that call. No one. In fact, you were doing something unrelated to making a phone call and you stopped everything to make that phone call. And it's not because you were thinking about the person or anything like that. You just got this instant unction to go call someone. And nothing was going to stop you from doing that. Hmm? Well, there you are. Now, when you made that phone call, you may not realize. It may have meant little to you at the moment. You may not understand why you did that. But I can almost guarantee you the recipient of that phone call needed that phone call. I can almost guarantee they needed that phone call. You ever been in a rough spot in your life and to hear another human being would have made a big difference? You ever have one of those moments? To hear the voice of reason sometimes would have made a world of a difference. You ever have one of those times? To hear someone correct you or to hear someone beg you not to go through with something would have made a world of a difference. Well, guess what? The Lord used you to make one of those calls to somebody else. You didn't know why. You didn't. 
You didn't know what for. You started to comply. Your phone never rang, and you look at the phone, and you say, huh, I'm not touching that phone. Anybody ever do that? See, we have two cases. There's been a time when your phone rang, and you had the unction not to touch it, but you answered it anyway and regretted the fact that you answered the phone because it took up your time, and it raised up new coals of fire in your situation. And there have been other cases when you something told you not to touch that phone. You just simply walked away from it. You didn't debate or anything else. You said, nope. And it was a good thing you didn't. Because whoever was on the other line, it turns out that person was simply trying to tie up your time in one of those worldly things, right? You guys have had demonstration examples of so many different principles. Here's the issue. A lot of people don't know about these principles. A lot of people believe in their own doctrine, right? They become unteachable, and so they can't see these things in the Word of God anymore. They can't make those comparisons because they become unteachable. If I were to ever become an expert in a subject, how many people could teach me about that subject? If I became an expert, if I thought I was an expert, right, in programming in a specific language, how many people out there in the world would I actually listen to? Not too many, right? When you count yourself an expert in any given subject, you're only going to take or learn information from those who may have a better mind than you do. You certainly will not. You will not consider what one everybody says. Early in life, I understood something and learned something. Always consider what everybody says, even when people think it's foolishness. You'd be shocked at what the Lord gives you through the most unlikely of sources. He did speak through a donkey, didn't he? And he also speaks through me sometimes. He helps you guys out through me. So if he can do that, be careful who you discard in your life. The Lord will take the most unlikely vessel. And speak his truth through that. God spoke through King Nebuchadnezzar. He did. God spoke through Pharaoh. He did. God spoke through all of his creation. Good and bad. He did. Remember that. It's only when we get wrapped up in pride. We become unteachable. We don't learn anything else. And we stay stuck. Stagnant. In our own knowledge. And we start dying in our own knowledge. The day you stop learning is the day you start dying. Plus, it's written in the Word of God that he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. I have confounded the wise. I have. Remember those things. Never become the expert on your own limitations. Don't do that. That's something we're going to have to work on. You know when a person says, well, I can't do that, I can't do, you don't know what you can't do. You don't know when it comes to the Lord. You don't know. You don't know. He does the unbelievable through the unlikely, all the time. Hmm? You'll do it in a heartbeat. Remember that. Remember that. All right, guys, now, we read Revelation yesterday, right? You guys are full of questions. Today will be a good day to go through some of those questions, and the reason why I'm making this altercation, right, we have, I don't want to put this. We need to, well, there's a, we need to identify, right? We broke the barrier, I'll put it that way. I'm not talking about the boat. 
You'll understand, but we need to find out who broke the barrier. And listen, guys in COT, okay? if it sounds strange one day, just give it a few days. It won't sound strange anymore. Okay? Stay up to speed. It'll all make sense. It will. It'll all make sense. Think of it as a coming out of the shadows type thing with me. That's all. There are so many people who they think things are so impossible. Things are not impossible. If you think something's impossible, you'll refuse to do it. You won't even act in it. You won't even trust anything about it. Thus, you'll never be utilized for things that you would like to be utilized for. I have some advice. Start believing in what the Lord said you are. Start believing in that. What did Jesus say that you guys are? Listen carefully. To many as believe upon his name has he given power to become sons of God. Gentlemen, ladies, do you know what a son of God is? A son of God is a direct creation of God. Not born of the flesh or of blood. Not born by the will of man, but someone born by God. Do you guys understand that? Why do you think the scriptures say you're in this world, but you're not of this world? Don't ever think you're what you are in the flesh. That's not what you are. That's how you're going through this process in the flesh. You're in this world, not of this world. Everything else is of this world. It does not have to go buy clothing, does it? We do. We're the ones that have to adapt ourselves to be here in the first place, don't we? Yes, we do. Everything else can lay down where they are, and they're fine. They're clothed. They're protected. They can deal with the elements. We cannot. You're in this world. You're not of this world. To as many as believe upon his name has he given power to become sons of God. That means to be born again. To have the power to become a son of God is to be born again. To be born again. When you're born again, you are indeed born again. It's not some title somebody puts on you. It is something that happens to you. Not of the flesh, but of the spirit. Many of you know when you got serious about the Lord, the desires you had inside actually changed. You have a new desire set. And you do not desire those old things anymore. That is part of being born again. Do you know that? That is part of being born again. Mm -hmm. My goodness, we're so close. So, so, so very close. So close. I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm going to answer some of your questions from yesterday because you guys, I, I couldn't get all of them. I couldn't do that. And we're still on the, I'm still on the, still on the station uh, today for one more day. Anyway, well, that could be extended. I hope not. But uh, we need to find out who broke the barrier. But I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT, everybody. Okay, everybody. While you guys are getting prepped, I'm going to turn to Revelation, uh, 20, let's see, where were we? Revelation 21, let's see. Here we are. 
just to have that open. Mike, did you see where they said the moon is rusting? Looks like the barrier has been broken through. It will unmask itself. It will unmask itself. It's unfortunate, too, because when it does, uh, there will be new sensationalism around the moon, right? So all those who really know about it are going to be squashed out to the outskirts of that subject. Unfortunately, if you told the truth now, it will go through one ear and out the other. So it's best for things to be uncovered, right? Best for things to be uncovered. I remember back in, uh, it was a long time ago, that's been a statement I used to make for many years since the 80s. Because it was the 80s when certain things were known by me. Right? It's only a matter of time. Can't cover up all things forever. Can't do that. And again, when it happens, so listen, when that happens, when more things happen, you're going to have a bunch of people that come out. And they're going to become experts in that subject. And everybody will run and listen to them. They will. I suspect they're going to lie, lie, lie. They're going to come up with more theories, fascinating theories. Theories can sometimes be fascinating, but it does not make that theory a truth. It doesn't. And so in that respect, many are going to still miss the mark. If you haven't noticed in this day and age, right, when you make a subject interesting, everybody gravitates towards that, right? They want to be thrilled. Uh, they want to learn some fascinating thing. They do. Very seldom uh, do people enjoy the truth. That's just the time we live in. Very seldom. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I'm the only one that has the truth. No, there are other people out there. They know very well what the moon is. They know the history of the moon, the true history of it, and what the moon can do, right? They know that. But it's just an unfortunate thing that uh, folks will heed to themselves teachers having itchy ears. In other words, they're going to want to hear the exciting part of things, right? And to make something exciting, you have to make a bunch of stuff up. Or, you know, professionally, when they make stuff up, they call it a theory. That's how you do that, right? You make a bunch of stuff up, you call it a theory, and there you are. And in the Bible, it says that those people are going to be running around they're going to be satisfied with all the entertainment, all the fanciful things they can ever imagine. But they will not have the truth. And they will perish. Right? They will perish. <clears throat> it's not a good idea to sensationalize the moon. It is a very destructive force. It is a dormant force. But it won't, won't remain dormant for long. It just won't. Right. Somebody says, is that part of the veil? Unfortunately, no. That's just part of our environment, believe it or not. Not part of the veil. You know, the veil is uh, far more extensive. And it's very difficult to grasp, even if you were to experience. If, if a person were to experience what some people on earth have experienced, your mind would still not accept it. What I'm telling you is this, is that you can, suppose you saw something, right? Right in front of you, you saw it, you interacted with it. Say you interacted with something for a year, right? After that year is up, the day you walk away from it, you think a person will be used to it wrong. Your mind, for some reason, is going to try and flush that thing out. It's going to try, it, it does not, your mind does not want to remember certain things, period. It does not want to accept certain things. There are certain things that are far beyond the ability of man's mind to have a comprehension of. So that means you can see it, you can interact with it on a daily basis. But as soon as you get away from it, it's almost like your mind will try and purge it, get rid of it as quick as possible. You begin to second guess yourself. You have to call people and say, hey, did we really do that? What are those type uh, scenarios? And that actually happens. That really does happen. But 
That's just where we are. In time, in time, in the transition, you'll know all things. All things. Nothing will be a secret. Nothing will. Nothing will be a secret. Right? Life forms are like that, too. For example, there are guardian life forms that uh, if you saw one, right, you know, if it was in your home, you could perceive it, but you you can't really capture it as something uh, as being part of your, you know, daily walk or something like that. You you couldn't do it. These things are very evasive, and your mind will attempt to purge it. It will. If you don't know it spiritually, if you can't accept it spiritually, if you're one of those who needs proof, the proof, you can have the proof in your hands, and your mind still will not accept that you're holding proof. That's the way that works. So the whole truth is only going to be known, only going to be known after the transition, not before. No one has the ability to maintain it anyway. They can't do that. Uh oh, did did somebody lose uh, audio? Hopefully not. Uh, hopefully this thing is not uh, too loud for you guys, right? I'm hoping it's not. Let me turn this back a little bit. Just a little bit. All right, so hopefully I answered that question to the best of my ability, right? Hopefully I did. Hopefully I did. Somebody says, so you don't think God made the moon? I said nothing like that. I said that we can't comprehend the moon is standard, though. It's just like our environment. God made all things. Why would, uh, where would that, where would you get that from? Where would you get that from? Help me understand that, uh, that feedback statement. So you don't think God made the moon, somebody typed. Where's that coming to play at? Who else would have made anything out there? I, you know, one of the biggest, like the earth, the earth, people believe that the earth has a molten core. You do realize that it's theoretical. It can never be proven. You know that, right? They theorize it has a dynamo. That is only theory. That's not fact. It's not fact. And in, in, in truth, every time they drill, every time they get close to certain things in the earth, they find something totally different from what they theorized. There's an impenetrable barrier. Nobody can get through it. It doesn't matter what type of drill head you have. You can't get through it. And there's nothing there. Think of a drill bit that goes in the ground. It hits a blank spot. Listen to me. It hits a blank spot where nothing is there, like an empty cavity. And then it hits this impenetrable barrier, right? But there's no dirt, no metal, no lava, no nothing. The drill bit is simply smashed up with no fingerprint of what smashed it up, like an invisible, impenetrable barrier. Something we don't understand, right? They bring the drill bit up. It, it just looks horrific and horrible, though it hit nothing. They send one down with probes on it, right? They start measuring pressures, and they perceive or see, by way of sensors, a huge cavity, an empty space. So why can't the drill head go through that empty space? No one knows. No one knows, right? No one knows. This time they're going to try and cut it. They're going to try and cut it with a particle accelerator. That's not going to work either. That's just not going to work. It's an impenetrable barrier. In Russia, they did actually dig down to a specific place. And they concreted that place up so quick. Now, we're not talking about the hole. We're talking about a cavernous system. They went down to investigate in a specific town. And there was an influence in that town. Right? They go down to the bottom, and, and, and this is funny, because it scared one day. There was a day in history when just about everybody who calls themselves psychic was frightened. Isn't that strange? And 
they warned about this place. Well, the, you know, the Russian military went down there anyway. And three days later, they poured an obscene. They had trains coming in with concrete. Concrete. And they put concrete in this cavernous system. They tore every house down, every structure down around this place and plowed it to the ground so that nobody could ever find it again. My question is, what could scare somebody that bad? Well, they would put concrete in the place. Did they report the findings? Yes, the findings are on their public. Can people interpret the findings? Of course they can. They just won't believe them. There's an influence there bound in Russia. An influence. That if you start getting near that influence, it'll speak beyond every thought you have in your head. You have no defenses against it. All of them described it as evil. Can you imagine? Hardened, evil soldiers describing something as evil. Can you imagine psychics who work by the power of Beelzebub describing something as evil? Can you imagine an evil beyond all evil? Right? I personally believe it's one of the fallen angels. I do. I do. What came out of that was this thing. Is older than Adam and Eve in the garden. It was uh, lots of biblical things that came out. And they sealed it with concrete. Turkey, something similar happened. They had underground caverns in Turkey. They would take school buses. A uh, school bus one time went down into one. It never came back. All the kids were lost. Then it happened again. They ended up placing uh, certain entryways under guard. To this very day, green smoke comes out of this place, a toxic, smelly place. Nobody can get near. There's one person who got near it who talked to somebody down in there. That was Ahmadinejad. That's why he was so special to so many people. Because he can actually converse with whatever was down in that place. That's in Turkey. Ahmadinejad is from Iran. That's why in Turkey there is a complex of all those leaders in Turkey that think they are the Mahdi. They think they're special because of that influence, because of prophecy, their prophecy. Their prophecy came about because supposedly an angel of the Lord came down and gave the Torah or the um, Quran, right? To a guy named Mohammed. Do I believe that? No, I do not. I've read the Quran. I've read plenty of those Hadith writings. And it's still the age-old argument back to Abraham. It is somebody's clever idea to tug folks away. And in fact, the same description of Satan this is a faith overtone of that entire thing. Does it teach peace? Yes, but in a very controlling way. Does it teach sacrifice and all those things? Yes. But people have to keep in mind, Satan is kind to his own. He is. Satan can be loving to his own. Demons can be loving to their own. But they have an appetite. And it can never be filled. Imagine being around stuff like that. Knowing about stuff like that. Having hands-on experience with things like that. You think it's going you think it would change the way you believe in the Father? Surprisingly, no, it wouldn't. Is still a choice you have. But your life would change, that's for sure. So I ask you this, what happens when the world's exposed to it? Because they will be. The whole world's going to be exposed to it. 
A very special storm will come. It'll consume everything. And every falsehood will be incinerated. Everything that is not the living God will be incinerated. Everything. And if any of us, right, having darkness destroyed from us, if there's nothing left to save, well, then you have your answer. When the Lord comes back, all iniquity that is upon his saints will be removed. But I ask you this, how much of you will be left? How much of you is going to be left? Remember, everything we do down here on this earth, we are choosing to do. We choose to sin. We choose to do iniquitous things. And we are totally accountable for those things if we do not have an advocate. Who is Christ? And the only way to have that advocate is to obey. Because those who say they believe in Christ but don't obey, Jesus said, don't call me Lord. Why do you call me Lord is what he said. For those who attempt to obey the Lord but stumble from time to time, not, not this purposed stumble, but they find themselves back in the clutches of some weird situation, the Lord will always deliver you. For those who like to go back into the world and sin again, a day will come when they will never be able to come back to Christ. God promised that if people continue to do that, he will give them over to a reprobate mind. And they'll think that those inconvenient things that are bound within sin are slight, even normal. They'll be given over. If they're given over, grace and mercy is no more. While grace and mercy is here, all of us can repent. When God gives people over to a strong delusion, when God gives people over to a reprobate mind, grace did not maintain them. And that's, how, that's your Lord's timing. He'll decide that, but those days are certainly coming. They're coming. Somebody said, drill recording come from Russia where you can hear heard screaming. No, I believe it. I do believe it. The noises, for example, the noises in the skies, all those noises are coming back. And there's a reason they're coming back. Remember all these people start recording these strange noises in the skies? They're coming back. This time, many of you are going to hear them. Your animals are going to hear them. You'll hear them. And your animals are extremely sensitive to infrasound. Right? That's uh, frequencies below 20 hertz. Very low frequencies. They, they are extremely sensitive to that. 34 decibels at about 10 hertz is very destructive. They'll hear that, too. It's going to scare them to pieces. You will not know why, because you cannot hear infrasound. They can. So they respond to the other realm differently, because with the other realm comes infrasound. Animals can hear that coming a mile away. Sea creatures can hear it coming a mile away. We cannot. We only hear in a certain band. And it just so happens the band that we hear in is the band of speech. Somebody says, Mike, if Jesus said we'll be like the angels, neither male nor female, why do we talk about Michael, Gabriel, Raphael as though they are male? Because angels in a male connotation are seed bearers, right? Anything in the heavens that is male is a seed bearer. Right? Anything in the heavens that is female has a womb that can carry the seed. Remember that. Has nothing to do with reproduction. That's for earthbound stuff. Right? Male and female, that's earthbound stuff. 
right? In the heavens, when, when God speaks of something as male or female, it has to do with having a womb or not. There are certain demons that are considered female because they can reproduce abominations in the earth. They never do so by themselves. They do so with seduced servants of God. That's why. See, we got to make sure that, for example, that, that term male and female, right? And God never really used that term with angels, did he? We assigned that to the words that we read. And so what we got to be careful not to do is take man's knowledge and apply it to heavenly things. we got to be careful not to do that. And remember, God is the authority in his creation. And we ought to find out from him what these things are and apply them to everything else. Then we can see it. Otherwise, you're going to utilize man's knowledge to define your father. And that can never happen. That's what people do right now when they try to liken all these events that we're having to these conventional things that's in our environment. That's why people have been wrong for so many thousands of years about so many things. Seek the Lord for his knowledge and apply that to everything in creation. He is the authority on creation. Creation is not the authority on him. If you don't fall for it, you can clearly see that in just about all things of men, it is attempting to degrade the Father or to humanize the Father. That's why I'm a bore in certain areas. Like when people say God has a sense of humor, people should never say that in my opinion. That is an arrogant statement. A very arrogant statement. A sense of humor is foolishness. If the greatest wisdom of mankind is nothing but foolishness to the living God, then what do you think a sense of humor is? Do people speak things that they have no idea of the ramifications? Somebody said, my quarter of these sounds. I think this time they're going to be very telling, very telling. But they're, listen, again, there are hidden elements inside the earth. Some of those sounds in the heavens are not coming from the heavens. They're bouncing off the heavens. Coming back down to earth, they originate within the planet. Could you imagine something so loud that when it voiced out something, it would penetrate all the mountains and everything else and go straight up into the atmosphere. And the sound waves would bounce off the uh, a very special part of the atmosphere coming back down to Earth. And one time, during the demise of a bunch of cattle, a similar sound was made. And people thought it was one thing, but in fact, it was the cattle. It was a cattle in massive distress. But it didn't sound like cattle. After it was, after the sound waves were bounced or reflected from the atmosphere, it did not sound like cattle. It didn't sound like that, right? Some of these things are inconclusive. I would encourage everybody to simply ask the Lord what they are. But listen to me. Always be ready for the answer. The Lord can show us anything. That's not the question. The question is, will we have the comprehension to keep it? And what is our motive for wanting to know in the first place? We're to do all things that edify the body of Christ. All things we do is to have a, to have a result of lifting up the body of Christ. We're not to do a vain work, right? Or hope for a vain thing. But that everything we do should be highly purposed. So that means the motive for the, the reason why you ask these questions. Make sure you qualify those within yourselves. 
so it's not bound within some vain thing. Because then you're just wasting your breath when you do that, when you try to ask the Lord for something that's vain. You're going to forget you asked in the first place, right? If it is needful, you're never going to forget what you ask for. And if it is bound in truth, it's going to be for somebody else, which means you're looking out for somebody else's deliverance. And you're going to have much. Whoever does that, the Lord will bestow upon that person much. Well, hopefully I uh, answered that one to a small degree. Is the destroyer an angel? Well, in, in the time of Moses, right, there was a destroying angel. In the time of Jeremiah, the Lord described the destroyer, right? The destroyer of the Gentiles. So it seems, biblically, it can take a few forms, but it's always sent by the living God. In Jeremiah, it told us that the destroyer of the Gentiles was on its way in the translation, right, it means it was set on its course. It's already on its course, and it will complete its course. And in the time God has given it, it will do what it needs to do. That's going to be based on God's timing. According to the book of Revelation, we're going to have an encounter here on this earth that's going to upset all life on the planet. Not some, all lives. All lives. So, take note of that one. All right? Take note of that one. Okay, guys, where are you guys at? Let me see. Let me see. Sure, release. T, explain. What is that question? Guys, I'm missing. I'm right there in COT and I'm missing it. Give me some more. Give me some more. Not the one-liners. Three days until 40 nights or 40, right? Yes, yeah, something like that. Something like that. Mm -mm. I wonder how many people at the, at, at, if something takes place, right? You guys do realize if something takes place, it's just going to take place, right? You do understand that. How do I know this? Because I've given timetables before, and you know what normally happens, so you know the truth is, people will always make up their own answers to what they think it means. I remember one time I said one thing and everybody else said something else and everybody forgot what I said and they ran away with what they said. We often do that with the word of God, don't we? Right? We do. We will run away with things we shouldn't. We stay put with things we should run away with. We often do that. So one of the keys is this. Be careful of self-interpretation. Observe, just want. Let things be what they are. Right? Let things be what they are. In other words, try not to uh, do like they do in Hollywood. Remember what the Lord patience is always required. Patience is. Remember, it's the Lord's decrees that mean something. Right? Not man's. The Lord's, his decrees, his word, that's what matters in your life. Not the person. All right, guys, what do you got there? Question Revelation says, God shortened the times for the saints. Is that a time slip? Well, let's go find out. He said, for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. What days? The days of turbulent tribulation. 
What days of turbulent tribulation? Well, he just told those in Judea to flee into the mountains, right? He said, pray that your flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. For then will be such tribulation as was not since the beginning of the world to that time, nor ever will be again, right? So it's going to be a bad time. Deceit will be all throughout the earth. It'll be a very oppressive time, very dark time, right? Those days are going to be short. The days of persecution are going to be short for the elect's sake. Just the days of persecution. Okay? Those days will be short. No, that's not a time slip. That means your father's going to do a quick work of what he needs to do. I don't believe that's a time slip or anything else. I believe that's simply God telling us he's going to do a quick work. He's very consistent with that term, doing a quick work. Right? He already told us in the end days he'll do a quick work. Right? So, what that means is... He says that time is going to be short. You have, to, you have to see that in context. That's that turbulent time upon the saints because he only shortens time for the elect's sake. Those days are going to be shortened for the elect's sake, not for everybody else's sake. That means their time of suffering, their time of trial is going to be shortened. That's what that means. Now, so what about these time slips? That's only a phenomenon. That's just a phenomena, right? It's only a phenomena. That's all. See how good the Lord is? Let, let me read it to you real quick. You ready? It says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, 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 no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So in other words, if God had not put an end to the suffering, everybody would have died. That term, no flesh, would have been saved. That's mortality. That's the death of the body, of flesh. Take note of something. He said, there should no flesh be saved. Well, Jesus did not die to save your flesh. He died to save your soul. Right? Not your flesh. So what is the Lord talking about? No flesh should be saved. That means if he did not intervene, if he did not put a quick end to it, people would have kept fighting and doing whatever they were doing until nothing was left. And so he put an end to it for the elect's sake. Now take note, after this suffering, he said, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. He's telling you, I'm, I'm telling you this before it ever happens. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. He says, and then he says, for as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What does that mean? Listen, when lightning comes out of the heavenly vaults, out of the sky, you recognize lightning. Just as we recognize lightning, so will every life form on this planet recognize Christ. So no one's going to say, ooh, I think that little dot over there is Christ. And the other person says, no, I think this big symbol over here is Christ. They're not going to say that. They're going to know who he is. Now let me explain it this way. <clears throat> Suppose you go into a crowd of people, you're at a big, you know, outing, and everybody's eating outside. And your best friend of friends shows up. And you see him a long way off, right? You only see the silhouette. But you know the walk. You say, is that so-and-so? Now, all you can see is a silhouette. But by the person's walk, you begin to identify. As a person gets closer, you say, wait a minute, that is so-and-so. You still can't see any detail. But you know the person's walk. You know the person's habits. You know the person's movements. You know the person's everything. And then all of a sudden, you say, that is so-and-so. Out of all those people. That you could see clearly, you identified the one you couldn't see clearly correctly. That's how it's going to be. It's going to be your recognition of a family member. You're going to look and you're going to say, there's Christ. Just as you would remember 
a family member from a long time ago, you're going to remember Christ. You will know his face. You will know it is Christ. You're going to have no question. Every, everyone will know it is Christ. Satan will know. Every demon will know. Every devil will know. Everybody's going to know it's Christ. No one will mistake it. The whole world will behold it. Okay? The whole world will behold it. And there we are. See, that's why I said, that's why I said, a lot of people try to say, well, he's coming like lightning. No, it's not what it's, it's giving that as a comparison. That's a comparison. Just as a person would recognize lightning, because you know what? No one sat there and told me, Mike, that is lightning. Nobody told me that. I don't recall anybody telling any kid, see that? That's lightning. It's like an automatic recognition. You know what that is. And you also know to get away from it, right? Well, some of us do. I kind of like lightning because it causes people to shut up. It does. So I kind of like it. I like storms. I'm odd. Don't worry about it. Anyway. So in this same respect, that type of identification is within you with the Messiah. Right? You have that type of recognition within you that's built into you. All those who come from him, recognize him. But in this case, every living soul is going to recognize him, even those who pierced him. My goodness. Why? Because upon his coming, there is no veil. You guys do understand that, right? When he comes, there is no veil. Christ represents the flesh, or this natural and the spiritual. In fact, he represents all realms, there will be no more veil. No separation of anything when he comes. Of nothing. Everything will be seen for what it is. Nothing will be hidden, obscured. Nothing. All things will be seen. And you can see that also in the scriptures. All of these things are in the scriptures. It's just that we don't read them that way. You know, a lot of people, I'll say it again, a lot of, we have learned to read scripture by popularity. In other words, people read a short passage in a specific way, and they say, well, that's what it is. No, it isn't. Once you read in context, once you read the whole chapter, then you read the whole book, then you start seeing what things are, right? If you just read a verse, you're going to get the whole thing wrong. Suppose... I said to you guys, you know, I have $500,000, and I'm happy. You guys would say, oh, great, but I didn't tell you the whole thing, right? Here's the whole thing. Well, I had a dream last night, and on this dream, a bird dropped a bag, and in that bag was a bunch of money, and I held the money up and said, I have $500,000, and I'm happy. But I woke up depressed because it wasn't there, right? See, that's the whole dream. Now you, understand, now you have it in context. If you pull something out of the middle, you can make it mean anything you want it to mean. When you have things in context, then you have the story. And so you get the little statement right. There have been so many cases in history, people have pulled God's scriptures out of context. And they have turned them into something that God never said, but that the people wanted to hear. And that's not very good. That's not very profitable. Okay? If we knew the whole truth. See, back in the day, back in the day, instead of some of these false prophets giving people the whole truth, they gave them the good part only. And when they gave them the good part only, God said, you're weakening my people. By doing that, you're weakening them. They got all happy with the good side, and then when the bad parts came, they were not prepared for it, and they folded up like a lawn chair and couldn't take it. God said, why did you do that? Now, a real prophet gives a warning. He's not coming to tell everybody what they want to hear. He's going to tell everybody what they better have straight, or else. A prophet always comes with the or else message. You better get this right or else. That's what prophets came with. Now, if the people would have heard those messages, 
Then when the storm came, they would not have been surprised. They would have stood their ground. They would not have folded. You just tell somebody the good side of something, and you disregard the rest of it. You're not telling the truth. You're weakening people who hear it because they're going to expect the good. They won't understand the dark that comes with it. They'll think something went way wrong, and they won't have the strength to stand. If you told somebody, you know, listen, a boat is coming. And when this boat comes, you're going to get off this island with no food. You're going to be taken to an island with all food. People get happy. You say that for years. And then a storm comes. The people are going to be disheartened, aren't they? They're going to faint. But if you tell people, listen, five storms are coming. They're going to be devastating, but you will survive. Some will pass, but some will survive, and these storms must come. But after these storms, immediately after these storms, a boat will come and take you to a place where you can have all the food you need. See, if you told that truth, people have it in context. They're not going to expect the boat prior to the storms. They're going to expect the storms and indeed prepare for them. And when the storms pass, because the people had it in context, they're going to encourage each other saying, hey, this storm is good. These storms are going to pass. The first storm comes, everybody says, is that it? Is boat coming? No, not yet. We have four more. And indeed, another storm comes. Somebody stands up and says, is that it? Surely this is it? Nope, we have two more. You see the difference? And then people can survive and still have hope and still learn even in the middle of troubled times. And they'll be happy about the truth, joyful about the truth, not a lie. Now for the person who refuses to hear about the storms, when the first storm hits, their stomach is going to be sick. When the second storm hits, they're going to be ready to give up. When the third storm hits, they're going to commit suicide. Because they thought the boat coming was a lie. See how dangerous that is? That's why we need the whole truth. Not the goody two-shoes version of everything. Saying, saints, don't worry. You're going to get out without a scratch. That is not what the Lord said. He gave us these bodies that will be discarded for a reason. You get a new body. If this body was to be kept with no scars, scratches, or permanent damage, you would not need a new one. You're not your flesh. Your flesh is going to go through much. You will be victorious. Salvation for you is in Christ. But all of us must go through this process. That's what people don't want to hear. And as a consequence, they don't know that everything is purposed in their lives. Everything, even the evil, is purposed in their lives. And so what do they do? When they don't know that, they make up excuses. Well, maybe God meant this. Well, maybe God meant that. And they keep doing this till they get to the point where they argue about Scripture. Well, I think this Scripture means this. Well, I think it means that. You know what happens to the folks who don't have the whole truth? They are miserable the whole time. You know what happens to those who have the truth? Every bad time that comes, they get excited because they'll say, God said this would happen. And then the other people look at the one who's excited going through the rough time. They say, well, why is that person excited? Why is that person still on fire? Because they have the whole truth. And when you have the whole truth, prophecy comes to pass regardless. So then every bad thing that happens, they'll say, my Lord told me I would go through this, and they start jumping up and down. And everybody's looking at that person like they're crazy. But the one that refused to have the whole truth, they're sick on the stomach. Oh, I can't take it. Right? We're not to be that way. We're to have the whole truth. And God warned those prophets back then, those false prophets. He said, you're killing my people telling them lies. You're telling them all the good stuff and not my whole word. Don't worry, they're going to be dealt with. But you better be careful because they do the same thing today. 
That's why people are running around scared to death of Revelation. Why would somebody be scared of what Jesus is doing? Huh? Why would a person be fearful or even try to escape what the Messiah is doing? Nobody has authority to open the seals except the Messiah. So why would somebody be frightened of what the Savior is doing for us? He opens the seals for us. It is not against us. It is for us. Why is everybody so afraid? Because somebody didn't tell the whole truth. And that's what's breaking people's backs in this world. That's what's causing people to be so tired, so disheartened, so discouraged. Well, it's time for us to have the whole truth, don't you think? I have put mouth disease, so I'm going to tell the whole thing anyway. That's why I like roughneck Christians, because at least they'll listen to the whole truth. They accept it, and they say, well, this is what we have to deal with. Let's go for it. It is the Messiah. The Messiah who opens the seals. He is the one that initiates revelation. Our Savior. Hmm. That's what this place is for, the whole truth. That's why we have no marketing, no advertising, no heavy ways to say, hey, you can't say that. We can say anything we want to say. I pray it always remains that way, with or without me. With me, it's going to be just that way. Somebody says, uh, in the 37th, says, April energy wave. What do you say? Something to worry about or no? Uh, for the sun, yes, it could be something to worry about. But so long as the polarity of the magnetosphere is the way it is, we're okay. Listen, if the polarity of the magnetosphere changes, it's not going to be okay. We're going to, you know, we're going to have to learn to deal with some extraordinary circumstances. Now the days are coming where the dirt will blow. The red dust will be everywhere. And a type of lottery will be in effect. But we'll deal with that when it gets here. So long as the polarity of the magnetosphere is the way it is now, we're okay. We start experiencing reversals of things. Then we have something to worry about. Right now, we're okay. I'll explain that to you guys one day this week about the polarity of the magnetosphere. If it ever changes, right, then the slightest solar winds are a Carrington event. Not a CME, not a flare, but the slightest solar winds will become a Carrington event. Somebody says, Michael, why would God give somebody the attribute of humor? I don't think that, listen, people can say what they want. All right? God is very sincere about this process. Satan is in this world, too, and he gave man foolishness. That's what he gave mankind. And if you really think about it, I don't need humor. I don't. Because I have joy. I don't need to tell a joke, make something funny to be funny. I have joy. I'm very appreciative of things in my life. I don't need humor. Right? When you have to make someone laugh, you're making up lies to do it. We're doing something foolish to do it. God doesn't put that in mankind. That's something man gave to himself. Man does a lot of things to make up for the dark spaces in his or her life that they have no understanding of. Right? 
I look at life soberly, and I'm not tired. I know my humor level is near zero, and I can make funnies sometimes. But I don't think God gave that to us. He didn't give us that attribute no more than he, he didn't give us the attribute of lying. He didn't give us the spirit of fear. He didn't give us the attribute of lust. He didn't give us the attribute of desiring somebody else's stuff. He didn't give us any of those things. That's what Satan gave us. By the fall in the garden, sin entered into the world. And all these fleshly attributes came. See, by way of your spirit, there is no humor. There's perfect peace. All that humor and everything else is bound in the flesh. It is what man utilizes to make up for so many missing things. They have no completeness because they refuse to go through the authority of completeness who is our creator. They deny so many things, they're going to run around with a void within them. A void that is meant for them to find the way home. But they're trying to fill it with everything else. Hmm? Somebody said joy is happiness. No, happiness is fleeting. Happiness comes and go, and joy is eternal. Joy is very different. Joy is very different from happiness. Very different from happiness. Joy is something the Lord gives. Happiness is something we experience from time to time. Almost like anger. God did not give us anger. Did he? God did not give us rage. Did he? Hmm? God didn't give us lust. Did he? No. He didn't give us any of those things. He didn't do that. God gave us a completeness. We lost it in the garden and it was corrupted. And through Christ, we can have it back again. So then get it back. Then you'll have an understanding of why you don't need humor. When you have complete joy. Right? You don't need a substitute when you can have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Hmm? See that? By the way, who defined humor? Humanity did. Humanity did that. See, that's where you have to be careful. You cannot use humanity's wisdom, right? And apply it to heavenly things. We gotta we can't do that. We just can't do that. Humor? That's from mankind, right? That's from mankind. All that stuff is from mankind, just like football is. God, do you think football is played in the heavens? Hmm? Who made that up? What about wrestling? Hmm? What about going to a range? Man made that up. That stuff's not in the heavens. And so we have to make that, we have to understand that difference as much as we can. Because the vocabulary and the things that we have categorized down here on this earth, that is man's wisdom, lest it come from the creator. Man has categorized one thing and lost the original knowledge of what things are. That's why most often humanity walks around so helpless, so incredibly helpless, looking for alternatives to fill in so much that's missing. Listen, with Christ, you don't have to be missing anything. But it takes turning back to Christ, not being the expert on what life is. I'm not the expert on what life is, nor is anybody else. God is the expert on what life is because he created life. And you have to seek the originator of life to find out about life. Otherwise, you're going to have man's definition and come up short, as everybody else has who believed everything that they gave. And whatever man gives up the flesh is influenced by who? Satan. Period. It's influenced by Satan. So let me, now I know this is heavy, but let me go ahead and tell you. Everything in your flesh. Everything in your flesh. Everything in it. Is tied to some satanic thing. Everything of your spirit is of the living God. That's why in the Bible it says the flesh and the spirit do war against one another. 
Jesus wouldn't even discuss the spirit that was in man. He said, I know the spirit that's in man, and we need not do anything but that. Satan is an expert on your flesh. He is. Satan has manipulated just about everything he can. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, what is the root teaching of the rapture? Pre, mid, post. Listen, I think that these are people's theories. Right? Now, there's one time in the Bible that is not a theory. And that's when Paul spoke. And he was talking about a specific time. And he said, that day will not come unless there come a falling way first, and that matter of perdition be revealed. Right? So there definitely will come a time when all those who are alive at the last trump, if they be alive at that time at the last trump, right, and they belong to Christ, there will be what people call a rapture. That's absolute. That's right there in the word of God. But it's at the last trump. <clears throat> I think that sometimes, and this is just part of being a human being, Sometimes we dislike this world so much we want to leave right now. I've been like that before. I've been like that before. Right? Most people have been like that before. I even know some people who hate the rapture teaching. And the reason why is because something happened in their lives and they wanted to be taken and they weren't taken. They were left here. It's, it's, they felt kind of abandoned. So now they hate the subject of the rapture. I don't hate that subject. I know what the Bible says about the last trump. But I never discuss pre, mid, post, and all this kind of stuff. I don't go into that. That's not what the Word of God ever gave me. The Word of God gave me something very finite. At the last trump, those who are alive at that time, at the time of coming of Christ, when, he, when the last trump is blown, right, then those people who are alive at that time will meet the Lord in the air. That same thing is in Daniel chapter 12, when it's a horrible time in Israel, the most terrible time there ever was since there was a nation to that very time. Michael, the prince of the people of Israel, will stand up, and those who have been dead in the earth, they're going to rise too. The dead will rise first, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. So I already know the truth about that. What I do not do is add to it. I'm not going to add to nor take away anything from the Word of God. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not that bold. I'm not doing it. I will not sit here and act like an expert either and add my two cents onto anything and teach that to somebody else. Have you lost your mind? I'm not doing that. Scripture is what we need. God can explain his own words. Those are the Father's words as given to mankind. Okay? So, to each his own. I cannot make your decisions. I can only make mine. But there are certain things I will not discuss. Just won't discuss them. They are divisive at best. But I see, I, it, listen, I don't have to escape. What my Savior is doing is the point I'm making. Right? I don't have to escape anything. I do not. There have been people for thousands of years who have waited on the rapture and they thought it was coming in their time and all of them have been wrong. So I need not discuss that. The Lord knows when he's going to come and get me. I get excited about every single day's opportunity to serve the Lord yet again because I totally messed it up yesterday. That's in my mind every single day. So I never focus on, on getting away I focus on completing the work, to walk the walk, to be pleasing to the Lord. And each day I live in this world, I have no problem dedicating that day to my Lord and Savior. I, I'm not tired. I don't grow tired because I don't want my outcome to happen. Whatever the Lord has planned. I'm fine with, because he is the Lord. He is my Lord and Savior. He is my King. He is my Lord and King. I'm a person who's used to authority. It doesn't bother me. Right? And because I know he's doing it, I'm fine with that. 
he told me to focus on this day. He said, tomorrow holds enough trouble by itself. He said, take no thought of tomorrow, what you're going to eat or drink or wear and do all this stuff. That's what he told me. Right? That's what I have gathered from Scripture. But to put myself in this day, to be thankful for this day, to be careful never to curse it, to do everything I can in this day, to forgive all I can in this day, to assist all I can in this day, and to do everything I can in this day. That should I not have an X day, I will have done all I can do. That's my charge. So the more I can do that, the more authentic I am, according to the word of the Lord. Because he already gave everything to me. Not looking for perks or anything extra. I desire that people be free. I know that if the Lord can free me, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to tell you again, I'm not tired. I'm not worn out. I'm not. I don't even understand nor comprehend how a person can be worn out with the word of God. I don't get that. Not when you have the joy of the Lord. I know what it is to have fake joy. I know what it is to have the joy of the Lord. And when you have the joy of the Lord, you're not going to be tired. You're going to be quickened. Your commitment. It's going to get higher and higher and higher and higher. But when you wanted something specific to happen in the world and it did not take place, that's when you get tired. Think about it. Somebody said, what's the army in Jeremiah that takes context? You have to read that because it's controversial and people have argued about that just like they argued about the army in the book of Joel, right? When you read the book of Joel, it calls that army a bug army. That's what it calls, I'm not a bug. It calls that a bug army. I'm not a bug, right? In other words, listen, according to the book of Joel, right, according to some of these old books, God sent insects, devouring insects, to defeat mankind didn't he say he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise i often imagine what would happen if god sent countless number of spiders to overwhelm a country nobody could do anything there's not enough raid you can fire off every bullet you want it's not going to do a thing not going to do a thing what's that going to do you're done for if god sent insects against a nation it would not survive the best that they could do is burn themselves up Think about that. When it describes, it says they will not break their ranks. Insects are just like that. You stomp on 500 million, another 600 trillion come from around the corner. So they keep coming. Think about that. God will use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And that's something. <laughs> that gives me the jitters. Because if spiders ever came, uh, boy, that wouldn't be good. Right? I wouldn't want to be here for that. But the Lord names the army that he sent among people. Hmm. Somebody says this harsh. Well, that, what could people do other than burn themselves to get rid of the bugs? And in the Bible, doesn't it say that men will seek death and will not find it? That men will desire to die, but death will flee from them? Hmm? Yes, it does. Doesn't it liken those creatures from the bottomless pit to have, uh, you know, stings as a scorpion? See, the truth is, we don't know what they are. Have you guys ever seen... The CIA's cricket that they developed in 1982, it's a cricket, it's a drone cricket. It's about the, that drone cricket is no bigger than a, you, you have two of your fingers, that's how big the cricket is. It can cover a thousand miles. And it observes and it looks and it looks just like a cricket. This was in 1982, right? They perfected the hummingbird in 1984. Did you guys ever see the hummingbird, hummingbird they had, the drone hummingbird? You cannot tell the difference between a real hummingbird and that drone hummingbird they had back in 1984. And the flight characteristics of this thing are so smooth and perfect, there's no way you could tell the difference. This was 1984. 
Right now, we live in 2024. Can you imagine what's really out there in use? That can be usurping, utilized against people that people will have no defense of. Biomechanoids are real, just so you know that. It's not theoretical. It's not some wishful thing. They are real. Biomechanoids are real. When they are deployed, they're kept in a type of fluid where they can be nourished. But make no mistake, these are drones. These are drones that process elements just like you and I do, and that's their fuel. They don't work off batteries. I said a biomechanoid, which means its battery comes from the earth just like your energy comes from the earth. I'll say nothing else about that except to say this. There are things that mankind has made that will scare you. Please don't think for a moment that somehow nefarious and evil people cannot overwhelm a nation within hours. And they can make it seem natural. If man can do that, imagine what the old ones can do. Folks, it's that time. I'm going to say God bless everybody. God bless each of you. Somebody says, what will be the safest place to move to? Well, that's not the question. It's not a place to go to. Listen. Listen carefully, please. Have your ears open to the Lord. How do you do that? You stay within obedience. Develop a desire to stay within obedience. Don't force yourself to obey. Have a heart to obey, and that's the difference. When you have a heart to obey, the Lord promised he would keep you. That's the promise you need over yourselves and your families. You need to be kept of the Lord. Listen, there is a scripture that states all the provisions of mankind are going to fail. Do you know how hurtful that is? All the provisions of mankind are going to fail. You know what that means? All their plans are going to fail. All their protective measures are going to fail. It's going to fail. If, if God is not instructing you through Christ, you're doomed. You're done for. So develop a desire to obey. Work that out in your life. Right? That's not automatic. Work that out. Look into Scripture. Find out why a dodo like myself can appreciate the Messiah so much that I will seek to obey him in the silliest things and even in the major things. That I will compromise all earthly happiness just to be pleasing and have a strong desire to do it. Surely you'll find it. You'll find out why the Messiah is worth everything in my life. I'll give you a hint. It's tied to you. See, because no one can serve the Messiah directly. What we can do is serve each other. I can't serve Christ directly. But I can serve you. I can't pay the Messiah back directly. But I can assist you. And in the word you read, do all things to another as you would do unto the Lord. That's what you read. Why would he say that? In your servitude to your neighbor, to everybody but yourselves, your servitude to everybody but yourselves is your servitude to the Lord. What you do for somebody, you have done for the Lord. And what you refuse to do for someone, you have refused to do for the Lord. Hmm? You see how that works. The Lord said, what you have done for the least of these, you have done for me. And what you have not done for the least of these, you have not done for me. That's what he said.
Go search it out for yourselves. You'll see. So as it turns out, to love your neighbor as yourself is very key in having a strong desire of the Lord. Because in truth, your neighbor's worth everything. And in your heart of hearts, you would do anything to save a human life. If you saw a human in distress and struggling, you would do anything to save a human life. You would sacrifice much to save a human life. And even if you're one of those who couldn't quite go through with it, you would have such conviction on you. You would want to give up everything to help that person out. You develop that desire and begin to do in those areas. Everything changes. That's real servitude. That's real servitude when you have that desire. Not by force, but to have that desire. And we all know how that desire is cultivated and how it's born. It has to be born in truth, sustained in love, executed with selflessness. That's the opposite of selfishness. Selfless service to somebody else means you really esteem the other higher than yourselves. Now you're in biblical compliance when you esteem others higher than yourself. Now you're aligning. When you do that, you're aligning with the word of God. And you will not be deaf another day. Nor will you be blind. God bless you all. I'm going to see you next time right here at COT, God willing. You guys take care of one another. And if something unfolds because a barrier is broken, well, who knows? We may discuss it. Until then, I'll see you guys next time right here at the Council of Time. God bless you.
families. God bless all of you. I'll see you next time right here. C.O.T.